us down here three right me along with the myth, the Texas legend, Mr. Chris Handy. And today we are talking digital marketing, pick our brains. And specifically what we're going to be hitting on is some recent questions that I've had from a couple of workshops I was leading regarding how do you find audiences to hit when there's so many different options of who to hit. And then also, what are the best social platforms to use to complement a content marketing strategies and email marketing strategies? So that is what's on the agenda for today. So how is this is a good one in Texas? And how was your yeah yeah um, yeah no, no I everything's going really well here and um, it is it was cold for a bit now we're warming back up but I, I, this this is a hot topic I want to jump right in I mean t- yeah. multiple audiences is huge sometimes I get in the weeds and uh, particularly with clients when we were. When we were working maybe three, four years ago on these type of strategies, we would spend way too long, I think, on on working on the personas and trying to get all those finalized. And we forgot to create content. <laughs> so we started to just, you know, just work. Yeah, okay, what do these personas look like? Let, let's create names for them and let's make a poster board with them and, and all of this stuff. But it can be really hard to actually manage an editorial calendar for to man even if you're just managing two personas. Let, let's say you're going after two different verticals, manufacturing and a uh, let's call it a, a professional services space. Those two verticals, completely different, uh, completely different mindsets there. So the content's going to be different and mm-hmm. getting it right getting a consistent dripped strategy so that so that I every week have something new for each one of those personas is very easy to do, but it's very difficult to actually get started on. And so that's what it took us a while to get in a good rhythm on. And so I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about all of that. I know we're going to dig into some specific questions and and all of that. Yeah. So this is I'm pumped. Yeah, I, I think if if we start out on that, the biggest tactic I always address to people, and we've we've addressed this in previous episodes, is the idea of the Pareto principle, the twenty eighty principle, that twenty percent of your audience produces eighty percent of your revenue, or twenty percent of your customers produce eighty percent of your revenues, twenty percent of your products produce eighty percent of your revenues, and the idea is you really need to spend some time honing and focusing down on who that is. One of my favorite advertising quotes of all times is, "I know." 50% of my advertising and marketing is working. I just don't know which half it is. Yep. And so p- part of that is, you know, being cognizant of taking some time and really listening and looking at some of your numbers to get a sense of who you best serve. And I think especially when we start worrying about or thinking about competition, when you get narrowed and focused on who you really serve first, That will help you differentiate, but it'll also help you make sure that you're creating content that addresses the challenges and the problems that somebody has. And I think um, another another huge point is I was just going through some Gary Vaynerchuk's jab, 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 right hook book again uh, for a presentation I gave this week. And his whole thing is unless you have a deep psychological understanding of your core audience, you're not going to be able to connect. And that that is something that, you know, you want to take the time to to do and to think about who do you best serve or who are the clients or customers that you've worked with in the past, assuming that you've had a business, who are those folks that have been the happiest with you? Who have you done your best work with? Or if you've been an, apl- an employee and you're branching out, same thing, ask yourself the same thing. Who are the people that when we get done working with them, they're like, you guys are rock stars, love what you did. You totally understood us. You totally got us. And those are indications to help you understand who that core initial audience is. Yeah, that's that's such a great, a great thing to start with. Who is the audience I need to focus on first? And some sometimes people forget that, you know, we're talking about segments here. We're talking about who are our audience for content marketing. And we talked a little bit about segmentation in your email list last time. So are we creating content for customers and non-customers? That's a. Th- this is very specific. Uh, if you look at a company 
like HubSpot, for instance, they have a whole blog dedicated to their academy, and that is to teach people how to use their software. So I love that it's content specifically for them to uh, to keep people using their product more successfully. So I think that's that's great. Mm -hmm. That's a great example of content marketing for your customers. And people often say, hey, it's easier to keep your customers than to go out and find new ones all the time. So part of your content strategy probably should include at least a thought process around should I be creating content specifically for our customers? And mm -hmm. or is our content that we create for our verticals does that meet the needs of our customers? So I would ask you, I would ask that question because sometimes that's the case. You know, in our case, we're mm -hmm. writing content around how to be more successful in marketing, how to get your sales team on board with the marketing department, that sort of thing. And that can apply to our customers and our non-customers. In fact, it, it mm -hmm. actually stems mostly from interactions we have with our customers. So, and it might even be in... in I'll, I'll let you on a secret. A lot of my blog posts or, or content is created from a question I get or an email I get from a customer and I just turn it into a blog post, my answer, because I know yes. that this would be valuable to everyone else. So I'm just like, hey, you know yeah. what? I, I actually, I thought this was such a valuable question that you asked. I turn it into a blog post and then I'll give them a more customized response along with it. But hey, they get a you know, 500, 800 word response along with my yep. customized email then that goes a long way. So think about your customers when you're designing these verticals and how does that play in before you, uh, yeah. before you really dig in and decide which vertical do I go after first with my content strategy. And if you look at uh, one of the things I want to point out on that HubSpot blog that you'd mentioned, and I put the link in the sidebar, um, is that they break it up. So they have on that blog page, they have a segment for marketing people, a segment for sales people, and a segment for agency people. So their blog, when you go to that page, it says your daily dose of inbound. So you know that you're going to get daily updates on inbound related to those topics. So, you, you know, sometimes when you have trouble choosing, that's another strategy you can use is to take and break out the, the some of your audiences and, and what they need. And I think they do a great job of when you have a bigger audience in terms of what you can do and how you can break things out. But the questions that somebody directly in sales has is different than what somebody in marketing has and is different than somebody who's running a larger agency. And they know that those are three verticals, three big markets for them, and they're customizing that content. So sometimes people, and somebody asked this question yesterday in the, in the workshop that I gave is, well, what if I have more than one audience? And what it turned out is as we dug deeper and deeper into who her three audiences, core audiences were, they had overlapping needs and she's kind of a solopreneur, entrepreneur. So the strategy we came with was you know try to find as much overlapping content as possible but hit one uh one key one um but if you can find some segment some way of sub segmenting so that people can on occasion get content that's unique to them but more often than not find content that would be value to valuable to all three networks all three audiences which there definitely was um that's helpful to, uh, as a starting point well, Don, on that note, when you see you have two verticals with with overlapping needs, could your and especially in the case where it's just you, you know, a, a solopreneur or you have a very small team trying to pump out a lot of content, could your focus be on just that overlapping need? You mm -hmm. could serve both audiences with that one overlapping need. You've got your Venn diagram, focus on the middle, you know that that's going to serve both audiences. And then, you know, think about your Pareto principle. Think about, does this serve the purpose that I need it to? But could that be where you start? And narrowing it down to the, pers to the vertical that you're speaking to may not be exactly what you want to do. Maybe your, your blog, instead of it being marketing or agency, maybe it is how to grow, maybe it's the grow your business blog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, exactly. So it's it's what is the outcome, the desired outcome that you want, and you could and in your post you say, in my work with with agencies and and marketers at their companies, we often come across this issue, and you know, and so that's that becomes the new way that you speak through. So it, I think it really is about bandwidth too. How do you yeah. manage all of that? 
I, exactly. And I think that's one of the things you have to be cognizant of, especially if you're starting out and you're just or and or just growing, getting momentum going is to be thinking of that bandwidth issue. And a lot of times as you dig in, you can start to see that there are, are these overlapping needs. So you don't have to feel like the fear of missing out. You know, the FOMO is, well, what if I miss one audience and I'm not creating stuff for them? I'm going to be missing out on them. And that's a strategy that you can use to work through that fear. And then usually what ends up happening is you start to see the content that's resonating the most, the audiences that are engaging the most over time, give yourself some time looking into the analytics, and then you'll be able to get a better sense of should you keep on the path you are on or sub segment in some way, or focus just on on one core audience. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, you have to start with something. And so often, like I said before, we would just we'd be two months into an engagement with a client and things wouldn't have gotten moving. And we've, mm -hmm. we've moved way more into let's start now with the frequently asked questions, partially from uh, kind of the, the work that, that you and I both done with Marcus and, and doing the, uh, the workshop on workshops and just pulling yeah. out all the frequently asked questions. Yeah. And that becomes your beginning content so that there's no delay in starting a content marketing program. Right. You just want to get some things moving. So I always want to have that that campaign rolling, right? A frequently asked questions campaign rolling all the yep. time. Yep. And then aside from that, you can you can create content that's not necessarily geared towards question, that's geared towards solution and that's geared towards a, a certain a certain persona or a certain vertical or however it is that you're segmenting out your audience. Yep. And uh, but but getting started, that that's the biggest thing that you have to do. And I th exactly, exactly. And for me, like, like one of the things that was neat after the workshop I did, it was an hour long workshop with a wide variety of business people yesterday. And somebody came up to me afterward and said, I, I loved the, loved the presentation, but I was confused at first because I thought this was about the, the workshop was on how to pick the best social network for your business. And the first okay. half of it was all about understanding the psychology of your core consumer, because once you understand that you can know what types of content will work for them, which helps in form which social network you should be using so if they're looking for lots of photos you you, should, you know you're not jumping on a linkedin you're looking at an instagram for example and um, it was really neat because you know went cycling back to that unless you know your core audience well it doesn't matter what tactics you're going to use because you're not going to be resonating with them you're going to be talking at people and people in this day and age don't want to be talked to they want to be helped they want to be uh, they want their problem solved and that helps you identify who those verticals are that you're going to hit so i think that's so what do you that's do to know them don like what's the best way to to jump in and get started because i i think that if you start to to google persona development you're just going to get a lot of i to put it bluntly there's a lot of amateurish advice out there for for, yeah. for persona development and it's hard to tell what is good and what is bad and for for lack of anything else i mean i think talking with your your own staff about who your customers are and that sort of thing is where i typically start but yep. aside from that or, or maybe you can talk a little bit more about whether or not you do that and yeah. what what you would ask them and then what else you're doing outside of those things I, and so exactly right. Talking to the staff, one of the other things, so talking to the staff and asking them specifically what they're being asked. And if they're unsure, have them start tracking it. So what are the questions you're getting? The other, And, and that's if they're, it's coming in over phone or if it's coming in person. Now, if it's mm -hmm. digital in any way, especially email, I say make sure to CC me and or forward any past emails you've got where people are asking questions, especially people who ultimately became customers. And what you start to see through that are the threads of what people are asking. And I don't so much worry about the exact age, the exact socioeconomic status. I worry about the questions they're asking and the problems that they're struggling with. And what happens is when we do that, it sounds super basic and it is, but basically all it is is you're listening actively to people who are already reaching out to you and you're looking for common themes and common threads of what's causing the struggles. So one of my most 
important audiences for my business are people who are really smart. They are really motivated, but they're so overwhelmed with all their responsibilities. They don't know what to do next. Yep. So they're, they're not lazy. They don't need kicks in the pants. What they need is somebody who's going to help them stay accountable and show them what they need to know to move the needle. And for me, those people are always looking for what what do I need to pay attention to next? What are the changes Facebook's making or HubSpot's making or whoever it is? And so I know part of my role is to be like a financial advisor. I'm not going to be investing these people's money, but what I'm going to be doing is coaching them on what they need to be paying attention to so their inbound strategy, their social media strategy is well-informed and they feel confident moving forward. And that's completely different than than other folks, you know, in terms of, you know, if they're just starting out and they want an agency to do stuff for them, you know, yep. how do I pick an agency to do stuff for me? I don't create that type of content because that's not what we do. And that just came through listening over the course of several months, finding out what was the biggest sticking point that people had. And also where did we hit home runs with clients who came to us? The ones that we felt like, holy smokes, you know, that is exactly who we want to work with because we did our best work. And then we start collating the questions that they had asked us, the emails that they had sent us throughout the process. And that's kind of phase one is, is that. Phase two then is we start looking on LinkedIn in particular and Twitter in particular, and now more and more Facebook groups to find people who might fit that profile and see what types of things they're asking or the things that they're conversing about, the types of stuff they're sharing on their social media accounts. And that gives us a sense of, you know, getting digging deeper on who the profile is. My, my concern with all of my clients is that they wait too long to have the perfect persona that they're working on their personas more than working on growing their business. Yep. And, you know, you can't just jump in without any information, but if you have too much information and you have no action, you're in the same place as doing nothing. And so that's, that's kind of this uh, action, um, action plan that we follow for our clients. I love that. I think it's great. I mean, you're you're digging in immediately to what what are the most relevant things with our most successful clients that we can be that we could be addressing. What what is the best uh, was the best content? What was most useful to them? What was most crucial to them? What was most relevant? And then you're going out and you're finding more people like your best clients on LinkedIn and seeing what they're talking about. Yeah, right. Exactly. I, I love that. Uh, so when you go outside and you start to work with maybe a larger firm and the the company's got a lot of moving parts, they've got a lot of com lot of people in the company, sales, service, there's you know, maybe they've got 500 plus employees. How do you start to unlock some of that when it's difficult to even get 10 people in the same room at one time? <laughs> And, and what we do in that case is we follow the workshop model. So for those of you who aren't feel, familiar with this, um, Marcus Sheridan talks a lot about these workshops and the value of starting out any project with a workshop. So what we do is we require the top people in the organization to schedule an event where we come in and present to the team. If a company is unwilling to do that, we won't work with them. And the reason is because we know they're, if the top isn't the top brass isn't showing commitment to something, everybody else isn't going to pay attention. So no matter how hard we work, we're just going to run into people ignoring what we're saying and doing. And then the customer is ultimately going to say, hey, you know, the, 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 your stuff didn't work the way it was supposed to. So we require the messaging to come from the top because if it comes from the top, and especially if the top brass is at the event, which they have to be, what that does is that demonstrates to everybody in the organization they are serious, that this is a serious initiative. So that helps us get credibility from the start. So that's that's number one. It's not always easy to do, but it's incredibly important to do because no matter how much I care about it, if the internal leadership doesn't care about it, it's going to fall off the radar once I leave. The second thing is I require that they have some type of organizer or head of each unit that can collate and oversee kind of like an assistant coach almost help each unit make sure that they're following through on the homework that we give them which is that starting out during the workshop let's brainstorm the most common questions we're asked and the things that we could be doing to help more let's brainstorm the, the point where our customers are coming to us what they're stuck with what specifically they're looking for and then what they do is they go back after the workshop 
and in their own units and in their own teams, they they have one person in each unit responsible for coordinating, gathering that information. So then the next time we get together, it's just the higher level team. We can now see these themes. We can now see these trends. And everybody has a voice. Everybody is represented. And so it allows us to make sure we're getting everybody involved, which we want everyone in the organization to be involved at some level, not just, oh, that's a sales thing. So we don't have to worry about yeah. it. Or that's just a marketing. No, you have to have everybody involved. And what I found when we do that, and I know uh, anecdotally from other people who've done this workshop model, is it ends up getting that consistent buy where people feel like it, it's it's something that has legs to it. It's just not a new, here's another new initiative from somebody. Just let's wait for a month and it'll be gone. Yep. You know, because you get you get that happening and people get cynical. But when they see that there's follow up and that's why it's super critical, you kick off with a workshop, but then you have consistent follow up after that with the with the top people who are responsible. It maintains that momentum and people can see that what they're providing isn't ending up in somebody's email box. It's ending up helping inform their social strategy it's helping inform their digital strategy and then they start feeling more invested in it so that's that's i think an incredibly important thing to do what about you what do you do as far as mechanizing it so we've started doing the workshop model as well with new kickoffs and uh the few that we've done since you and i both were, were at the workshop on workshops have been great a it's affected our our close rate in, in sales process just because i start I lead with that first just on a side note and uh, so we start with that. Uh, the follow-up process has been really, really nice because we are coming up with all of the actions everyone's going to take. We are we're doing, I mean, very similar to exactly what you just described. Uh, I, I think that getting everyone excited, getting, getting everyone understanding how their role will play into content marketing is really key. I think if, if someone in service is surfacing a question that they're getting and and they put the sticky note on the board. And this is this is what I will say is, hey, look, you know, if they don't have an internal project management system or some sort of online tool where they're all speaking and posting stuff anyway, then I go and we find a wall at their company and we make it the sticky note wall where they can go and put their questions that they're getting. And yep. so that's that's the key is that there needs to be some kind of way for people to surface the question in a very simple manner. It shouldn't yep. be, uh, it shouldn't be some online form that's very difficult to get to. You know, I could design something really, that would be really easy for me, but if they don't have, you know, if they don't have it bookmarked on their, on their browser and if they aren't thinking about it all the time, they're not going to be doing it. But if they see a wall that's filling up with all these different color sticky notes, you know, one for sales, one for service, and maybe the sales is a different color than the service. And you see that the sales is kicking butt and service is not throwing anything up there that that's visual. Everybody can see that. Yeah. And so yeah. we've started doing that exactly. And that, that seems to work really well. Now, if someone is going to throw an idea up on the board, they should be the one to own that content from the authorship standpoint, uh, all the way through the all the way through the ranks, and if something comes from that, then what? And we have one client that we've been working with this on a sort of a trial basis. What will happen if a lead closes that originally came in from that content? Will the person who originated the content get some piece of that? And that's mm -hmm. what we're we're Love developing that. a program right now. It's a compensation model for them. It's going to it's going to be a very small percentage of the sale. But it's going to be a percentage of the sale. And yes. that's not something that they had before. It's not, so, it's not anything that they had before. So there is an incentive tied to creating content that actually moves the needle rather than just putting up stuff on the board just to put stuff up on the board. Have you ever exactly. done anything like that? Because we're just trying it out and I'll be reporting back on how it's working. But I'd love to know if you know anyone else doing anything like that. Well, I know they did something similar at block imaging. And what I love about that model is it helps everybody understand they are in sales to some degree. So block imaging, for those of you who don't know, is um, a Marcus Sheridan client. Krista Controla is the vice president of marketing there. Fabulous, fabulous story. But basically, they sell refurbished MRI equipment. And they were having 
having 60, 70 people who were part of the organization with one person creating content, which was Krista. And Krista was like the dentist. She was having to go pull people's teeth to get anybody to create anything, which isn't fun for her. And people weren't, you know, oh boy, here she comes, you know, she's going to ask her stuff. They ended up doing the a content marketing workshop. And what ended up happening was they were able to start getting a whole bunch of the staff involved at some level in creating content. So engineers started shooting videos, mm -hmm. different staff members started started uh, writing content, others started talking to Krista and having her translate their discussions of what they were saying. And what ended up happening was whenever a piece of content resulted in a lead, Chris looked out or reached out to the person who created it and said, hey, just so you know, Chris, I got a lead today. And this person said that your video was what brought them in. And she said morale went through the roof when they did that because people started seeing that they weren't just an engineer. They weren't just behind the scenes. They were a part of the bigger whole. And they started, they have a couple of engineers now who are like video machines now you and i wouldn't be watching the videos for any reason because we're not looking for refurbished mri sure but refurbished mri people are looking specifically for information from other engineers and it's it's tr helped tremendously the net result in sales i know is in the seven potentially eight figures in terms of the difference that's made they've gone from 60 or 70 employees to now they have about 120 and a lot of that uh growth is attributed directly to their digital sales um so you know the that that type of not mechanizing necessarily with an incentive but with a recognition the the reason i love the incentive model that you're talking about is one it's kind of cool that you know people can get in, get uh, some economic value mm -hmm. but people are tend to be competitive and you start seeing that one office blue blue posts for example are being represented and you're like well wait a second yep. we're the yellow team we need to start getting some stuff up there let's 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 get this going on and so uh so it, it i love that idea so i'm really anxious to see how that turns out yeah, I, I can't wait to get back out there when they're more up on the board. I'm going to take pictures and I I want to I want to build a case study about about this because it's something we started doing and um and I just I just think there's no better there's no better visual representation than just these two different things, right? I mean, it's up on the wall. You can see the difference between these two and how easy is it to just throw it up there. And write and I and I can write it down right when I'm on the phone with someone, and it just becomes so simple. But um, we've got a few questions. I want to make sure we get yeah. to these. So um, why don't we throw this one? I think it, we can transition right into, um, and, I, and I know we're going to get to Steve's here in a minute. But how do you not alienate your home office, home audience, while expanding into a growing audience? From Matt here. That is a great, 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 great question. Um, one of the things that you have to think about, or at least that we look at when it comes to the social side of things, and that's kind of what's on my brain because I've been doing uh, uh, some social stuff this week, is looking at do different networks provide different value to your, to your audiences? So for example, some audiences that we've worked with, or some businesses that we've worked with, one of their audiences is really heavy on Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. and another one is really heavy on link um instagram so what the instagram group wants is behind the scenes feeling like they're a part of something a really intimate experience and so they're looking for different kinds of um content versus uh, another audience so that's kind of a simple high level how do you how do you not alienate in that way now sometimes you can't do that one you can't afford to take the time to jump onto a different social network and learn it if you're not good at it or you don't feel like you have enough content what i always do is i look for and i push my clients on trying to find are there common threads like we talked about earlier that we can start out by bridging content together it's very unusual in my experience to have a client base that is so divergent that certain pieces of content will only relate to one segment or certain pieces of content if they do relate to only one segment will make another segment feel completely alienated well, so for example there's, I'm there's the local oh, versus non-local right and mm -hmm. i know that that we we have events and stuff that are local that 
if I just push that out or put it on the same channels and send it to the same segment uh, for for everyone, then it, that people would start to feel like it's not relevant to them. So I, I, I think everyone probably has that issue. I don't know. Maybe not. And, and so, for example, I'm working with a large fitness uh, center and they've got families that come there in particular working moms is one of their big segments where there are certain types of classes that they like and they're really concerned about daycare and then we also have uh classes that are specific to people who do swimming and we're talking fairly intensive masters level swimming and then we have people who do power lifting and so they're all going to the same fitness center and so one of the challenges is how do you create content that fits each segment and fits each audience and so right now they don't have the bandwidth to do a multi-channel approach so we just mix them in together different pieces of content on their Facebook channel now what ends up happening in that case is we'll use Facebook ads to target or boost the right types of content to the right audience mm -hmm. so for example when we're putting up something about daycare and maybe there's a kids class that's just starting where you can bring your kids and do fitness classes with your kids well we're we're not gonna just put that on the regular Facebook page and amplify it we're gonna put it on a Facebook ad and amplify it to that specific audience. And the other thing we do is we take time figuring out who the influencers are. So who are the moms who are most active interacting with us and sharing stuff? And we reach out directly to them and let them know. And then a lot of times on social in particular, they'll share that content with their audiences. So they help us sub-segment rather than us having to do it. It takes a little time to do it. But again, if people know that you're really listening to them and paying attention to them they're highly much more likely to share your content and shared content is gold in this day and age unwanted or unsolicited content even though somebody might want to see it in their feed isn't nearly as valuable coming from us as an organization as it is having a friend who's a fellow mom share something with somebody as an example yeah that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense so with not alienating your home audience you know i think the, we could this could also apply when you are starting out with one segment but maybe you're you're branching out into a new segment right that example i used earlier manufacturing and professional services right so if if i've been serving manufacturing companies for the last 10 years and all of a sudden i'm going to start targeting some professional services firms and i just put that into the same channels put that in the same feed it it can be a little jarring to those folks that are, that are uh, used to seeing manufacturing content. And uh, just to bring up uh, the HubSpot blog again, because, you know, we I think I bring up their their stuff because they're just an excellent case study in so many in so many ways. And there are some things I don't believe they they are the best at. And I'll definitely mm -hmm. call them out on that. But when I do feel like they do a great job, I'll call them out. But the, the fact that that when we talked about the different segments that they have on their blog, agency, marketing, and sales, those are actually different blogs. So you go to their blog yeah. homepage and then you click agency and it goes to a different blog that's the agency blog. So that blog homepage is really just sort of an aggregator of all the different blogs that they have. And I can go and I can subscribe to the agency blog and I can navigate to the agency blog rather than having to subscribe to the entire thing all at once. And then I've, I'm getting irrelevant emails. And so mm -hmm. if, if I know that someone came and subscribed to my agency blog, then I can send them more relevant content, do more targeted Facebook ads and things like that with custom audiences. And I can get very strategic about the content that I'm producing for that particular group. I can also weigh how many people are in each group. So agency marketing versus um, agency and sales and and marketing Those are the three blogs right their marketing blog is by far their biggest blog second is the agency blog and then the sales blog they're growing right now and that that may have surpassed the agency blog at this point mm -hmm. but i know it was kind of neck and neck there for a while so with, they actually look at their marketing blog as their sort of main channel. So when something really takes off on the sales blog and, if, and it's applicable to everyone or takes off on the agency, agency blog and it's applicable to everyone, they might republish it on the marketing blog because it could work. 
So if you yep. just look at how they're working their content, then I think that's a great way to look at it. Just have different blogs. And if you have the ability to do that, and you can do it with WordPress, you can do it with just about anything, just launch a new blog for each segment. I would always yep. make sure they're on your domain and they're on, you know, subdomains or, or um, a subdirectory of your domain or, or something so that you control the, you control that. I wouldn't go and make it on a WordPress or something just to make it easy. It, it might be difficult to set up, but it might be worth it if you truly do want to go after those different segments. And, and I think that's the huge point is making sure you understand clearly why you're going after that other segment. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I talk about a lot um, and I deeply believe in is uh, humans have a deep innate uh, need to belong to something, to feel like we are a part of something. And the really great companies, what they do is they make people feel like and actually be part of the company. So quick examples that you can always look at, um, Harley Davidson. You know, if you stop and think about it, people literally put a company logo on their body. They put it all over their car, all over their house. Apple's another example. Pro sports teams are another example. And why is that? Why, why are certain companies, why do they get that traction? Well, they make you feel like you're a member of a community. And I have examples everywhere from Fiskars, the scissors company on down that does this to some degree and can do it well. So you have to keep in mind, one, you know, you're not always going to keep everybody happy, but how can you make people feel like they're a part of the organization so they're more likely as you expand and change or add things you don't feel like you're losing them i, I i'm curious matt I, i'd like to dig in later on because uh, you're a, he's a student of mine that to dig into that because uh, it sounds like again that there's some concern that the audience might be so different that you start talking about something that you're going to lose your home audience and i don't know many markets where that actually happens like your content it's like you know i'm, I'm talking about digital marketing and suddenly i'm going to switch to home brewing you know that's a pretty big leap and that's you know but yep. usually if there's sub -seg some sub segments i can uh, address either in email newsletters or on the blog hey there's some new exciting things coming on in this area and so we're going to start adding content in for x y and z because we see that there's this huge overlap so you just explain to people ahead of time as well and then they can give you feedback they can reach out by email or they can reach out by something and say what they like what they don't like but more often than not if you believe it's in the best interest of your company to start expanding you know, you gotta you gotta go for it, and you're not gonna have everybody 100% happy with your decisions. But you try to do the best you can and not alienate or not make people feel like they're not part of the process in some way. So hopefully that answers the question for you. Very cool. So let's look at Steve's question here. Do you tweet to lists so that only people in the list see your tweet? Now, I don't. Can you do that? I don't know that you can do that. <laughs> I, that's a really good question because I do a lot on Twitter and I have never tweeted just to a list. So on Facebook, now, if, if you, you can do custom, you can limit things to certain audiences and things like that. But I believe on Twitter, everything you do in your, when you tweet publicly is, and I'm making a differentiation between that and private messaging someone directly. Everything you do is public. Yep. So I, that's my understanding of that, and I, I just don't believe you can do that. Now, you can monitor lists, and you can look at lists to gain information, and we, I actually do that. I've got lists set up where I'm monitoring industries to kind of see what's going on. But, um, mm. you know, I, I don't think you can do that. Now, Steve, if, if you can do that, then I want to know more about how to do that, and I want you to tell me how to do it. Now, you can do it with ads. You can certainly do mm -hmm. it with promoted tweets and ads and, and that kind of stuff. And so if that's what you're talking about, I don't do a whole lot of Twitter ads. In fact, I've done it with a client, but I've never done it for my own business. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems to work great, you know, when we're trying to pr promote certain things, uh, specifically we're trying to promote eBooks and things like that to people in a very targeted industry. And, uh, but I, I find that LinkedIn targeted ads and, and Facebook targeted ads just work better for, for driving content leads and stuff like that but yeah i that's that's uh that's all i've got on that what do you think don yeah so i, I see that matt has something in the sidebar about um going to a list name and tweeting directly at that um i have not done that so 
that's a, that's a really interesting uh, idea. Now, if if it's wor working and functional in the way that I think it is, um, and the way that it's being described, absolutely, it would make sense to tweet out lists. Uh, it, because you want to make sure that those people see that content. Now, it depends on the size of the list and it depends on how important it is. So let me explain. So if I have a list of 300 people from somebody else that I go to and I'll use other people's lists a lot to learn, to identify who to, who, who are the smart people following so I can start learning from other smart people, um, you know, I'm not going to necessarily tweet at their full list because I don't have any... Um, rapport necessarily with them yet. My take on it is I'm going to find a few core people who are on that list. And it, what I'm saying a few, it could be as many as 50. And I'm going to send them a personalized tweet. Now, it might be the same type of content I'm sending to everybody, but I'd want them to know why I'm reaching out to them. This goes back to that psychology of people feeling like they're a part of something. And when you get a personal message in some type of way, even though it's public, I'm not talking direct message, I'm talking public stuff. What that does is that makes somebody feel like, wow, the person took the time to reach out, assuming it's not spammy and salesy, assuming that it's that it's helpful in some way. Um, if it's somebody that I've been tracking for a long time, I'm gonna develop some type of relationship first before I reach out to them and ask them for something. But that's kind of my take on it is the personalized tweets for me go a little bit farther uh depending on what i want to get but if you're tweeting just at a list if, if it's especially if it's your own list and it's already sub segmented i would certainly say try it and see what happens I, I i have not done it myself but you know it's basically a sub segment and you're trying to target a sub segment so um you know you can certainly do that that is really interesting i've never seen this before this is totally new to me um cool yeah, uh, that's very. Cool. I'm gonna check it out. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use his example to try his, yeah. his etiquette post here on the side, and we'll see. We'll see what happens, and uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you, Matt, for for sharing that. So hopefully, Steve, that answers your question. Neil has a fantastic question as well. So, what are your thoughts on Facebook Live video? Is it going to kill the Periscope? Huh. So I don't do a whole lot of Periscope. I have Periscoped, but I don't do a lot of it. I'm doing the blab. I'm doing the blab with you. The blab. Um, <laughs> but I, I believe that probably uh, the I, I believe Facebook video and Periscope have already killed Meerkat. So I'll answer that question that he didn't ask because I haven't heard about Meerkat mm -hmm. in a long time. Uh, I, I think Facebook video is probably going to really take off once people figure out how to use it. Uh, I mean, I see yep. our mutual friend George using it a lot. I don't see a whole lot of people who are not in this space using it yet. Uh, I think once people figure out how to do it on their phones, that we'll see a lot more of it. And then I think that the thing is that Facebook already has the users and that's the advantage that they have. So yeah. it's, I don't know that it's necessarily going to kill Periscope. Periscope is, it's integrated directly with Twitter in a way. I think what Twitter might want to do is, is move that in more as a part of the core Twitter feature set to make it more of something. Cause they're having a hard enough time getting people to just use Twitter. And mm -hmm. so to get people to use Twitter and Periscope, that may be kind of an issue. I don't know. I don't know that it's going to kill it. I think it's two different channels, but I yeah. certainly think that Facebook has that user base. And, um, you know, the, you know, Mark Schaefer and Tom Webster's podcast this, this past week, they talked about the, the, uh, switching cost that Facebook has mm -hmm. and, or was it, was it that it might've been their, their podcast, but, uh, basically, so, someone I was listening to on a podcast had an incredible point about the switching costs that Facebook has created. You can't leave yep. because your friends yep. are there. You you have to leave. Yep. You have to stay because your friends are there. And if you leave, you're leaving your friends. And yep. Twitter is Absolutely. not as much that way. Periscope certainly not that way. So I think there's just a big leg up that they have in in doing that. And if I, I wanted to reach my friends with a live video, I certainly wouldn't be trying to do it on Periscope. 
Yeah. And that's, and that's one of the interesting things is looking at that's called relative advantage and relative advantage, um, you know, is what is the advantage of making a switch to a social network? P why didn't people jump on Google plus one of the huge reasons they didn't initially jump on Google plus was because they even back then already had their friends on Facebook and porting everything over was a pain. Why don't people jump from Google Docs to Microsoft, whatever, or Microsoft to Google? Well, it's because it's, it's a pain. It, the advantages of what you'll get in the, in the long term just aren't there. And Facebook has done a phenomenal job of building that foundation. It was neat. We just took an anecdotal survey in my class of 50 some students and said, what's the number one social network? If you could only have one. Now, these are 18 to 22 year old kids. What's the number one network you would not be willing to give up? You can pick anyone. I had expected things along the line of Snapchat and other Facebook was by far the dominant one. And I was like, really? And it's like, no, 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 no. Everybody I know is there, and it's like, I have to be there. I don't want to be there, but I have to be there. Yeah. And so Facebook has this has that built-in audience. Now, you're always going to have your people who are like, I don't like Facebook. I'm going to try something else. So Periscope does work in a slightly different way. Facebook, though, can start mimicking what Periscope is doing, which is going to be kind of the challenge um, uh, for, for Periscope itself. So we'll, we'll see what ends up happening in the long run. One of the things that's really interesting interesting too is to dig into and listen to some people like the other day Robert Scoble uh, the famous digital marketing guy and Sean Puri who is the CEO of blab did a live uh, a Facebook live video chat and it was really cool to listen to Sean the, the again the CEO of blab talking about how they fit a very different need and they don't see Facebook as a competitor and where Facebook is like rocking it and starting to rock it with video, they can't compete against Blab. And so basically his, his whole thing was if you really find a unique niche and serve that niche well, you know, there's there's room for lots of lots of things. It's when tools start to try to mimic what Facebook is going to be doing. Yeah. So if depending on what Periscope might do, uh, they 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 can lose traction there for sure but um you know it's it's amazing to me when you stop and take a a, a look at it yeah that was a great great point um uh, neil is that gary vaynerchuk and seth godin did a facebook live video this week and they had 3.4 uh, thousand live views wow. um it'll it'll be interesting to see because the thing that's different though with a periscope versus facebook especially during the daytime and and i know mark has talked about this mark schaefer has talked about this a lot is that people are looking to for snackable content so you're busy you're doing different stuff during whatever the daytime is for you and at night they're willing usually to put in more depth going through their Facebook feed as an example. The thing with Facebook live video is you're asking people for longer attention spans. When you come to a blab, you're expecting to spend 30 minutes to an hour on a piece of content potentially. When you go to Facebook, not so much. Yep. And so it's kind of different. It's kind of different and interesting because Periscope, you're expecting kind of the same thing, a longer interaction. Again, on Facebook, not so much. So people like Gary Vaynerchuk and Seth Godin can do that. But it'll be interesting to see if it translates to people like us. You know, can you pull in enough people who are willing to spend a longer period of time when essentially during the daytime, Facebook is a fast food restaurant? you know, people moving really, really, really quickly. So um, will are they going to be willing to sit down for longer periods of time and have a bigger meal? I don't know. It's it, it's a very cool question. And, and the other thing that I was going to say is a year ago, nobody was using live video at all, which just is, is so cool. You know, the Meerkat, nobody knew about a year ago at this time. Periscope, nobody knew about. Blab didn't exist. Yep. Facebook Live didn't exist. I mean, it's just it's just crazy to think about where these things are going. Yeah, the uh, the whole thing about Blab versus those other platforms too. Well, yeah, Periscope is is ephemeral, ephemeral, right? It, it's supposed to go away, right? You, you, the content's going to evaporate, self destructing, unless you choose to save yep. it. And I don't want to create content like that. Now, some people do. Snapchat is built; it was built with that intended that way. And you know, if I'm going to invest the time in creating content. I would like for it to stick around and serve me once I'm done creating it. And that's just how I look at, at creating content. Now, there may be a situation where I want to just do something real quick, but I cannot fathom where I would just want it to completely go away. Um, 
it it wouldn't be a situation where I don't want anyone to see it because I wouldn't be doing that on the internet anyway. Uh, I have the grandma rule because I'm friends with my grandmother on Facebook. I'm only doing things that I want her to see. <laughs> And so th that's just kind of how I live. So I don't know. I, I don't I don't really I haven't gravitated towards and I see there's a there's a question in the chat pane. You guys like Snapchat for business. I just haven't spent any time there because it, it has been yeah. one of those ephemeral networks and I may be missing out on something completely and I just haven't spent a whole lot of time there. I don't believe right now that uh, that it's something that I can add to my mix and stay sane so but it, you know it i always would want to evaluate this stuff i would want to see are these are these platforms going to be good for for me and should it work now blab yeah. is one of those things where hey this is great it's a completely different platform from facebook live video from uh, yep. periscope and from any of that because we can have this talk show and we can have interaction with people and i there's nothing like this and they continue to make it better yeah. all the time uh, but yeah, I don't know anything about Snapchat. I, I actually have been digging into Snapchat with a number of clients and a number of successful local business people. And Snapchat, what is so fantastic about Snapchat is the depth at which you get to know people. Mm -hmm. So you get uh, uh, an amazing inner level of interaction with somebody it's not like going to a networking event i i like to i jokingly will say in my classes it's like speed dating you know speed dating is like high level quick 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 the snapchat is like going on a second a third a fourth date where you sit down at a nice meal and you really get to know each other and i think it is it is a phenomenal tool if you can use it. And that's one of the biggest challenges is, um, and I know we didn't get to it, so maybe we'll get to it next week, but what are the best social networking tools to use? Gary Vaynerchuk a couple months ago gave what, what I thought was a fairly surprising answer, um, but I loved it. And his answer when somebody asked on the Ask Gary V show, which social networking tool should I be using? He said, pick a networking tool that you love. Yeah. So if you don't love it, you don't really create content. The energy of that content comes across as just, I'm here because I have to be. So if you have the energy for a Snapchat, 1000% go for it. If you have the energy for Facebook and Facebook Live Video, 100% go for it. Or if it's Twitter, go for it. I, so I think it's important. Yes, you do need to find your audiences on those, um, but I think doing some levels of experiments and figuring out where you wanna go deep is, is really valuable. And Snapchat for the depth of audience is just amazingly cool. I'm not a heavy user of it myself, but for my clients who use it well, for my friends who use it well, that's the value they give. For me, it's the same as you, Chris. I just have depth on other networks that I want to expand and I want to experiment. If I have to pick up uh, uh, between Blab and Snapchat, for me, Blab is much more my style and it works better for, for me. And so I like to experiment it, but Snapchat has a lot of legs to it, David. I'm, I'm with you 100%. The data stream is huge and it is, it is really, really uh, a powerful place to be. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, it, it's it's what do we like to do? What do we want to spend our time doing? And that is that's got to be your biggest question. Uh, we got one yep. more question here in the chat pane. I'm going to put it up as a question, even though it is from David. I'm going to put it up so that we can put it up in the video itself. Uh, David says, I want to spend more time on LinkedIn for B2B, but the bland format of LinkedIn seems so boring. What are your thoughts? <laughs> My, that's that's a great uh, question. I think a couple of things to be thinking about with it is what do you want to accomplish there? You know, specifically, why are you going there? And if you're going there, you have to adopt part of the culture. So if it is really bland and boring and you really don't feel like it's it's going to be a big value, don't do it. Now, Gary V, again, this comes from jab, 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 right hook. It's, it's fresh in my head because I was reviewing it this week. He said, you know, if you're going to Norway 
and you want to get the most out of your experience of Norway, you have to read about the culture and understand a little bit of the language in order to be able to interact with people and get the most out of your experience. If you go there and you don't study anything about the culture, you don't know anything about the culture, you're not going to get as much out of it. And it's very similar to social networks in that you understand the culture of it, you understand what's expected, then you, if you're going to go visit that place, you have to, at some level, play within the rules. You could expand and try some things with video and experiment with some video just to see what you want to do. You know, maybe you go into LinkedIn and LinkedIn Pulse to build some thought leadership. That's really your goal at first is to not necessarily network a lot, but start creating a foundation that'll lead to networking. Then maybe experiment with some Snapchat type videos that might not play well, but I don't know for sure. It might play well with some some audiences. So do that 30-day experiment, 60-day experiment that I like to talk about a lot. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm I'm always torn with LinkedIn because I get great traction there, but the traction that I get is from other marketers, not from my customers. So it's like, what am I there for? Is it for those folks or is it, you know, and so, so it's a tough one because I, I like this format myself, the, the video type format. Um, there's just a lot of value, but again, if you want to make the most out of a tourist experience, you got to be willing to uh, adopt part of that culture. And so playing within the rules, but that again, doesn't mean you can't experiment with different types of content. What do you have to say about that? Well, I think LinkedIn is as boring as, is your network. And so, and I know that if I just look at the people I grew up with that are on LinkedIn, there are maybe three or four people that are actually creating consistent content on there or even going on and liking or sharing anything at all, but they're there mm -hmm. and they see my stuff because when I see them, they're like, Oh, I see how you know, you're always sharing stuff on LinkedIn. I love your stuff. And, and there's, they're clicking on my links and they're just not interacting at all because they just are mm -hmm. not, they're not built that way or they don't feel like they can do it. And I don't know yeah. why. Um, and so there are going to be people that are, that just, that's their deal. They, they are there as it's a spectator sport for them. And yep. they're not going to engage things you can do. Could you, you know, for instance, there's a, there are a few people in my, in my network, just people I've grown up with in Fort Worth that I've, I've seen an article that I know that they would find value in and sometimes you email those articles directly. Sometimes I've gone onto LinkedIn and shared the article and said, hey, uh, John Smith, have you seen this? And you tag them in it. And then yep. what you're doing is you're kind of creating an opportunity for them to see it's okay to interact on this platform. And then they could say, hey, awesome. You know, thanks. And then, yeah. then now they've commented and they, they have broken through that threshold that they hadn't done before. So you, you, maybe yep. your job, and I see your name, your uh, handle's Brand Gladiator. I assume you're, you're in marketing. Uh, it, it is your job to help people break through that, um, that to break through and do that for the first time. And so, so look at look at that as an opportunity to do so. Make it not boring, so that when people come up to you and say, hey, and they say, hey, you know, I see I see what you're doing on LinkedIn. So you make it not boring. Yep. That's your job. Yep. And I love that just to kind of give my final two cents on it is that, uh, David, for me, when I focus on what Chris Brogan taught me years ago, the mantra of how to be great in business is to be helpful. Um, it, it's not boring for me to do the follow that strategy. And that makes a lot of sense is just say, hey, how can I help somebody out with something that I have found? I'm going to go share it with them on LinkedIn. And that sense of, hey, this person is looking out for you starts to build that traction. And for me, that's always fun. I mean, it's always fun to help somebody out because I know I'm a big golden rule guy that, you know, if I take care of other people, take care enough of them, give them what they are wanting and needing, they're going to look out for me eventually, whatever that might look like. Um, so I really, really like that. The number, uh, really quick, do we have numbers currently on how many people are using Le LinkedIn frequently? I just looked at this yesterday, LinkedIn numbers, 414 million total accounts worldwide 25 percent are active regularly which i believe is checking in daily according to linkedin so a mm. little over a hundred million which is still 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 a pretty decent number you know people are like oh it's a small network well a hundred million that's that's uh, and, and movers and shakers you know that's that the, those are the types of people who are there um it's it's a pretty potent network so yeah definitely worth checking out if you want to follow up too i um jason miller 
Jason Miller is, uh, I think it's at Jason Miller CA. He's one of the chief marketing officers at LinkedIn. He has really good interviews online about using LinkedIn well. Really, really, really good stuff. I think you should, uh, I'll just put his handle in there. Definitely um, check him out. I just listened to an interview of him on the Marketing Sparks podcast from last year and made it required listening for my for my uh, students in my digital marketing class. So you know what um, I'd love to do is dig into your uh, dig into kind of what you're going through in your digital marketing class sometime, and like what does your syllabus look like? What what are what are people learning today? And because I know that there are some uh, deficiencies in some of the programs that that I'm aware of. And I, and I know that you're bringing the heat. So I'd love to see what, what people are, uh, what kind of knowledge you're dropping up there. Yeah. We'd be happy to that. Speaking of bringing the heat next week, we'll have Sean Peary from Blab, the CEO guest lecturing in the class earlier in the semester. We had Mark Schaefer and George Thomas. Then we've got somebody coming in from the green Bay Packers to guest lecture and, um, a couple of other big organizations. So yeah, it's a fun, fun class. I really, uh, you know, fortunate to teach it and to have all these cool people help me teach it. And it's, it's definitely a challenge because how do you teach a moving target to students in, 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 in academic institutions where, you know, usually a uh, English syllabus looks like an English syllabus from 20 years ago. My syllabus literally during the semester changes just because of, of, of some of the opportunities that come up like last year, live video became part of the semester during the semester <laughs> and it, it didn't exist at the start. So, so yes, I'd be happy to do that at some point. Awesome. But on that note, we are a little bit over time. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to join us and to ask questions. Hopefully we provided some insight and some answers to you. Uh, we do this same bat time, same bat channel each week. I stole your line. Sorry. So 10 30 AM central standard time every Wednesday. We're here to try to help you answer your digital marketing questions collectively share knowledge so we can all do bigger things doing them better so thank you again everybody for the time all right see you later